Hello and welcome to the third International Online Electoral Integrity Project Conference. My name is Toby James and I am one of the co-directors here of the Electoral Integrity Project. We're delighted to have participants this year joining us from around the world, uh, over 60 countries, and we have an action-packed agenda spreading across the week uh, with 14 panels in place across multiple time zones, which is sometimes difficult to keep track of. This is not the only Electoral Integrity Project event this year. We also have in-person panels at the ECPR conference in Prague in September. So it'd be great to see many of you there in person as well. And of course, this brings the Electoral Integrity Project actually into its 12th year of international conferences and workshops, uh, going all the way back to Madrid back in 2012. We have to begin with some important thank yous. Uh, this week would not be possible at all uh, without the real people who uh, are kind of running the show behind the scenes, Maddie and Sophia. Uh, we also like to add our thanks to our partners, uh, International Idea, IFAS and the Carter Centre, uh, but also uh, to our new co-convener for this week, uh, Masaki Higashima Ami, who's uh, joining us um, to put together this week's uh, proceedings. Um, the workshop comes at an important moment in time. There have been widespread concerns about democratic backsliding around the world and elections taking place in a much more uncertain international environment. In this age, it's more important than ever for academics, civil society groups, practitioners and the international community to come together to monitor the quality of elections and also to identify evidence-based solutions for improving them. And with that in mind, this year what we've done is something a little bit different. Uh, we've made sure that practitioners are brought very much to the fore and also in the same room as academics so we can encourage that knowledge exchange. And so with that in mind, uh, our first session is going to focus on electoral research for policy impact. And it's going to be, it's been convened by the ACE Network and will be chaired by Cassie Emmons from IFAS. And in just one moment, I'll hand over to her to chair that. First of all, we're delighted to say that the Electoral Integrity Project report and data set is now available to download from our website. And with this in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce Holly Ann Garnett, who's going to give us the key points from the report and to map out some of the current trajectories in terms of the quality of elections around the world. So, Holly, do we actually see uh, electoral backsliding around the world, or, or maybe not? Over to you. Great. Thanks, Toby. Um, yes, it's my pleasure to get to pre present to you um, just briefly some of the new data that we have available through the Electoral Integrity Project to tell you a little bit more about who we are as the EIP. Um, let's just see if we can move slides there. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, um, the Electoral Integrity Project is is all of you. It's a network of, of scholars, practitioners uh, working in the field of electoral integrity. Uh, looking to answer the questions of how and when do elections fail, uh, what are the consequences, especially for things like security, um, accessibility, public trust, uh, and then what we can do really to mitigate those problems based on different forms of academic evidence. And so as I mentioned, it's not just myself, Toby, Maddie, and Sophia, it is um, a large group of scholars. We Every year we have a cohort of fellows, we have an international advisory board, um, and by coming to this workshop, you are now part of our network and part of our, of our community of uh, scholars and practitioners really interested in these questions of electoral integrity. Um, and as uh, Toby mentioned, this is one of the things that we do to this workshop that we're doing this week. Um, but we also do uh, major data collection projects uh, like the PEI index, which I'll be presenting in a moment, um, a number of different academic and policy outputs as well as opportunities for training, like our fellowship program um, and consultation for different electoral management bodies and international organizations, um, and really building a network of scholars and practitioners. Um, so be sure to, pay, to uh, sign up for our newsletter to find out more about those opportunities. Uh, what we'd really like to highlight today is a new data set and report that was just released on Friday. 
um, the year in elections report for 2023. Um, so the Perceptions of Electoral Integrity Project um, has been going on now for over 10 years. So we have over 10 years of data being able to track the quality of elections um, of every national level election that's happened since 2012, um, mid 2012 when Pippa Norris started uh, creating these data. And so we're pleased to um, present a new data set that's available to download from the Harvard Dataverse and the summary data is available through um, the report which you can download off of our website. And I'll just share some of the highlights of that um, to give you a taste of what to expect. Um, so these, this is the PEI index, so an index of the quality of elections using the most recent elections um, around the globe. And some of the, the same findings that, that have existed for the last 10 years are continuing to exist today. Um, elections with the highest levels of electoral integrity in Western Europe, and especially in the Nordic countries, uh, with Denmark and Sweden having some of the highest quality elections um, and top rated elections in 2022. Um, some of the lowest rated elections happening um, in some areas of Africa, um, which again proves to be a challenge that, that the international community has been noting for a number of years. Um, but we do notice a, a quite a bit of regional variation um, and also variation within regions. So it's uh, electoral integrity is not the purview of one region or, or one type of country. There is quite a bit of variation, which helps scholars, uh, especially and practitioners to know that um, electoral integrity can be can be achieved in, in any sort of climate or situation. One of the things though that we do note is that um, the campaign environment continues to be one of the key major challenges of electoral integrity around the world. Um, so especially campaign finance and campaign media tends to be an area um, on average at least that has low scores uh, across the board um, and this, this is issues looking at, for example, um, the role of money in politics, transparency and reporting of the money, um, unbiased media coverage, and the really the ability of, of all candidates and parties to uh, engage in deliberation and to engage in informing the public in a fair and equal way. Um, so this continues to be a major challenge. It has been since the beginning of the PEI index, but we notice that finance and media really are lagging behind uh, other indicators that are doing much better, things like um, the electoral results, uh, electoral procedures, and the vote count. Those areas tend to perform um, much better. So we are paying close attention to the campaign environment as one key challenge of electoral integrity moving forward. Toby teased a little bit at, um, at one of the highlights uh, there's been a lot of discussion about democratic backsliding of, of late. You know, is the era of democratization over? Are we moving into another reversal? Um, one of the questions we've really been looking at with uh, these data, but also with a special issue of electoral studies coming soon, um, is looking at this issue of electoral backsliding. And like some scholars have started to note, uh, it's really not an issue of, of over time, um, wholesale decline in the quality of elections. Instead, we see a lot of democratic convert or divergence. Uh, some countries really improving their quality of elections um, over time, and some countries uh, falling into democratic backsliding. And 2022 is actually a really good example um, of some of that with some of the key elections that we cover in this report. Um, so some of those elections that we cover, uh, there are really clear indicators of backsliding. We look at, for example, Hungary's legislative elections that happened in 2022. Um, you know, the PEI data really supporting this idea of a, a decline um, in electoral integrity from a lack of a level playing field um, and caused by uh, things like poor delineation of electoral boundaries, campaign finance and media not being regulated uh, in a way that is going to be fair and really favoring of the, of the incumbent at the end of the day. Um, we do also see some, some contests from 2022 that were, were a bit in the middle. So some kind of semi good news stories. Um, you know, we, we note that, for example, the U.S. midterms didn't have the same sorts of issues that the previous 2020 contest had um, with, some, with some jump in electoral integrity after a pretty dismal result in 2020 for the PEI index for the USA. Uh, we also know cases where electoral integrity is slowly but surely improving. Um, a case, for example, like Kenya's um, presidential elections that happened. Um, there, there are still um, 
some some challenges, but that experts really showed support for the legitimacy of the Supreme Court's decision to affirm the credibility ultimately of that election. And so we do see some divergence then in, in terms of, of countries where electoral integrity is improving and electoral integrity um, is, is also weakening in some other cases. So we, we wouldn't necessarily say that there's whole scale electoral decline. Um, so what we'd encourage you to do is to download the data um, and download the report. Um, it, the great thing is that it is disaggregated by different stages of the electoral cycle, also disaggregated by specific questions. So you can really build your own data set um, based on the, this expert survey on the quality of elections, um, which now uh, goes all the way up to the end of 2022. And we're working, of course, on um, preparing our data set for 2023 as well. We'll be continuing this project and we look forward to seeing all of your research and practical outputs that come from it. So I'll pass that back over to Toby uh, to welcome in the first panel, which is really going to build on these issues of how scholars and practitioners um, use data and evidence um, in order to improve the quality of elections. Brilliant. Thank you, Holly. And the only thing I will add uh, is also a, a note of thanks to our experts, because the, 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 the index is, is driven by experts responding to our survey. So these findings you know, are only possible because experts complete these, survey, these, these surveys and findings. And I guess these evaluations, importantly, aren't our evaluations of the quality of elections around the world. They are the experts' uh, evaluations of the quality of elections. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to get the, get the first panel started proper and we hand over uh, to, to Cassie Emmons from, from IFAS. Thanks so much, Toby. Uh, it's wonderful to uh, see some of these insights about the report and to uh, be have the privilege of uh, serving as chair for this first panel. Uh, so welcome everyone once again. Uh, we have an exciting lineup for this panel of several practitioner organizations that are longtime participants in EIP events such as this. Uh, the goal of this panel is to present some longstanding and some new research endeavors that are underway uh, across these organizations, and in so doing, to look ahead and ponder how we can better coordinate our electoral research efforts and existing databases in order to maximize their policy impact. Uh, so really interested to hear from our audience members as well. Uh, as we'll, we'll go through three uh, separate presentations, about 15 minutes each, I'll give a, a signal to our presenters when you're at two minutes left in the traditional fashion and start waving my hands when you're getting to 15. Uh, and But for, for our audience, please feel free to add questions into the chat. We'll have our Q&A session at the end uh, after all three presentations, but don't feel uh, like you need to wait until then to start putting questions that you have in the chat. Uh, and as Toby was saying, we'll pause the recording at that point. So really, we want that to be a really uh, interesting conversation to dig into the great data that's going to be presented. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenters. Uh, we have Obehi Okoji is a program a program associate, excuse me, at the Carter Center's Democracy Program. He is also the coordinator of ACE. And we'll be co-presenting with Michelle Kahn, who is an analyst with Elections Canada's International Relations Division and was formerly the ACE coordinator from 2001 to 2022. So their presentation, unless the title has changed, is focusing on what ACE usage tells us that practitioners need. So now I will turn the floor over to you two. Take it away. Thank you very much, Cassie. Um, it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel and um, to be having this conversation today. Um, like you said correctly, our topic focuses on what ACE usage tells us that practitioners need. I will be co-presenting with my colleague, Michelle. Yes, welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Becky and everyone. Okay. Thanks. Um, so Michelle and I are going to be approaching this um, discussion today on two levels. I will um, start off by um, doing a quick description of what ACE is, um, some of the resources we have, and then I'll pass it on to Michelle, who will talk about how um, the resources on ACE are used. Um, 
ACE, the ACE Electoral Network, um, the ACE Electoral Knowledge Network, or simply ACE for short, um, is an online re repository of election-related um, information. Um, it also consists of uh, an election, uh, uh, an online community of um, election professionals um, in the in the uh, field of election administration. It is managed by eight partner organizations and um, um, ACE provides um, information related to election administration and other uh, aspects of the electoral process um, with the aim of fostering electoral integrity and then also to uh, promote professional and inclusive admi um, election administration processes globally. As we discuss a little bit um, in more detail shortly, um, um, ACE partners are currently working to expand the role of ACE um, um, as it is today in, in light of um, uh, uh, changes in the context in which elections are conducted. Um, Toby and some other speakers have alluded to some, some of these, um, but um, it comes to mind specifically things like um, the uh, influence of technology, uh, a virtually new information environment, and then a fast growing interest generally uh, from the broader pro public in elections and election management. But we are embarking on the renewal process confident coming from um, a 25 year history of innovation. Uh, when ACE was founded in 1998, it primarily was um, um, a knowledge hub for election administration and the cost of election information. Um, by 2006, it, it transformed into a network of election professionals. Um, this enabled real-time exchange of election information. To take another example, um, in 2011, ACE launched its um, election observation portal. Uh, and this was um, following uh, the commemoration of the Declaration of Principles for International Election Observation um, that signaled an increased profile for election observation, broadly speaking. So today, that um, um, election observation portal now houses over 1,500, 1,500 um, election reports um, dating back to the early 90s. I will switch to the next slide now. So coming from, from that um, sort of brief history, what is like today? Um, like I said, it's uh, managed by eight partner organizations. Um, it uh, has uh, uh, top, topic pages that are over um, uh, 20. Um, what the topic pages do is they uh, provide a snapshot or a summary for um, different election topics and allow you the possibility to connect to additional resources. Some of the key additional resources are in addition to the um, election observation portal that I highlighted or noted just now, we also have the um, encyclopedia, which is an in-depth um, um, information on the different stages of the electoral process. We also have um, um, the comparative data, which is a systematic collection of um, election information on over 200 countries and territories across the world. Um, there is also the um, elections materials hub or the elections li virtual library, if, if you prefer. Um, what the library does is it, it, it gathers um, um, election um, materials from different countries around the world. So you will find on there things like uh, sample ballot papers, civic and uh, voter education materials, legislation and regulations relating to elections from different countries around the world. So next slide, um, the depth of these resources uh, and just how um, um, vast they are. And I guess the, uh, um, the fact that they are available in um, multiple languages has um, really made ACE be um, a go-to um, um, spot for election um, uh, um, information, especially when it comes to the administration and management of electoral processes. As you can see here, these numbers tell us that in 2002 alone, um, in 2022 alone, um, is there were 4 million visits to the ACE website. 
uh, several of these uh, were to access information um, on the encyclopedia pages and then uh, specific country pages. About um, over 50% of uh, people who visited ACE in 2022 um, accessed um, the encyclopedia pages and about another 20% visited um, the uh, uh, country pages and comparative data. Um, but the question comes up at this point, how do people who visit the ACE website or harness um, the resources and information that are on there, how do they use those information? With that question in mind, I will turn over to my colleague, Michelle, who would um, talk to us a little bit more on that aspect of it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Yubei. And so then uh, that's the next slide. Uh, and so thanks again, Yubei, for you provided a great picture of ACES history and what it looks like today. And so as Yubei said, I'll now briefly touch on how all that great ACE content is being used. And this is really based on different internal and external consultations and network has held over the years, uh, which has demonstrated that it's very clear, different users obviously have very different needs when it comes to accessing and utilizing ACE. Uh, so before getting into all that, however, one point I would really like to emphasize is that ACE remains, it's the key reference point when it comes to the management and administration of electoral processes. So speaking from the perspective of an EMB as Elections Canada, while we have had great engagement with academics and researchers, uh, sometimes, you know, their perspectives and focuses are not always the same as ours, which is often quite focused on operational interests, you know, the implementation of elections itself. And so the great thing about ACE is that it's able to speak to these very specific aspects of electoral management, something that's really very hard to find anywhere else. So just as an example, you know, the issue of multi-day voting has been discussed uh, in Canada recently. And when trying to understand the issue internally within the agency, it's it was great to be able to just go to the ACE website and see right there an in-depth perspective of what's really a very granular issue. Uh, so ACE in that way remains a vital tool for practitioners. Um, it's also a non-biased source of information and with its global perspective on electoral processes, which are very relevant to practitioners, uh, it's, it's extremely useful. So part of that is because it's a product of not just one institutional organization but many reputable partners you know with different perspectives all working together and this means that ace information is often seen by practitioners as trustworthy and not privileging one perspective or the other which makes it you know easier to to utilize uh, and that perspective per partnership approach sorry uh, also means that it can serve as a central hub for all that content expertise and materials uh, that Obehi described, which comes from different partners and is really on a range of different subjects from, uh, you know, observation to all those those materials, which can really run the gamut. So in that sense, ACE is also a reference point. It's an educational tool uh, for individuals, but also for regional, international stakeholders. And again, from an individual level to really an institutional. Uh, and frankly, I mean, to get a good understanding of the fundamentals of election management, which is, again, a very specific topic, ACE is really a go-to for a person or for an institution. Uh, and ACE is also used um, as a source of data, that comparative data that Obehi mentioned, to inform ongoing research and can and has been used to develop other materials by practitioners, um, such as, you know, uh, seminars, workshops, you know, things of that nature. Uh, so next slide. Um, so keeping all that in mind, while ACE remains a great resource, we're also very aware that a lot has changed over 25 years. Uh, there's a lot more knowledge and expertise on elections out there, and as this event, and I think the work of the IP generally demonstrates, and it's really great to be able to engage with those scholars working on elections through events such as this. Um, and then international organizations such as IDEA, IFAS, the Carter Center, and you know many, many others have also built up this incredible expertise uh, which has been absolutely vital to for practitioners and certainly you know for elections for EMBs such as Elections Canada, uh, and then as of and Toby and Holly and, and everyone I'm sure is very well aware of it uh, is that elections are now more present in the minds of the public and and political actors than ever before, even if it's not always for the most positive of reasons. Um, so in the course of its 25 year history, ACE has always been on the cutting edge. Um, and as we're looking at the current moment, as Abay mentioned, we're thinking deeply about how to leverage and understand the needs of the moment and practitioners working in the moment um, to ensure that ACE stays on that cutting edge and that we can continue to support uh, people working in that field. Uh, so to that end, we're currently in the process of examining you know, some new structures and activities uh, which would help us meet that goal. So some ideas that are here on the slide include 
you know, updating and providing information on, uh, oh, sorry, I meant on the slide, so back one slide. <laughs> um, you know, some ideas include updating and providing information on emerging developments in electoral administration, such as disinformation, electoral integrity, you know, these are some of the things that practitioners, what practitioners really need when it comes to these challenging issues is, you know, sometimes a more strategic or holistic perspective, uh, which might be a challenge to do individually or as an individual institution for various reasons. Whereas ACE, through its, you know, multiple partners and members and, and, and partnerships with, with a group such as the AIP, can provide that kind of holistic perspective, or at least a platform uh, to think about or discuss these issues. And, and I'll get back to that later. Uh, because then the next point is what we also would like to do is we want to expand our data and collection and also visualization, which is which is a very important part of, of you know any data is how you present it. And so we want to make more data and more relevant data available to practitioners and researchers to help them, uh, obviously in their research, but also in operations and, and general understanding of electoral processes. Uh, and so as I hope I, it has been made clear, you know, one of ACE's great strengths is that partnership uh, approach. And so we want ACE to continue to function as a hub for information from different stakeholders, certainly the existing partners, uh, but we also hope to find ways to include research done by academics and the work of others. So really looking forward to discussing and hearing uh, from this panel on that research agenda for practitioners uh, and engaging with the EIP and others over the coming days and hopefully, you know, far into the future. And finally, again, on the issue of partnerships, ACE serves not just as a hub for information, uh, but also as a network of institutions and individuals who are discussing and trying to understand these vital issues. And having these forums for discussion as individuals on strategic issues and challenges is really a key need for practitioners, especially, again, EMBs, who often understandably were focused on logistics and delivering elections. So sometimes, you know, it's hard to carve out that space ourselves. Certainly, as Elections Canada, we have benefited from the expertise and the perspectives that are that just talking to different ACE partners provides. And so as the ACE network, you know, looks to the future, we want to continue and expand on that crucial dimension of ACE, which is why we're so happy again to be at this panel and in conversation with everyone. So next slide, please. Uh, so the final really slide is looking ahead again, just briefly to the next 25 years of ACE, we'll continue to expand on that on our base as a tool for practitioners and all that content you know, that Obehi laid out, but also keep looking for uh, opportunities to remain on the cutting edge of electoral administration and management uh, and working with everyone in the field. We think we need more expertise, more data, more understanding, you know, it's, and now it's more important than ever. Uh, and really this whole effort at the end of the day, you know, from practitioners to, to academics and, and all of us working in this field is really about understanding and contributing to the strength of electoral processes. And, and that's really a democratic society. Uh, so again, uh, I encourage everyone who's interested, you know, please check out the website. We'll, uh, we can post a, a link in the chat and it's also on the last slide. It's very simple, the ACE, ACE project. And uh, thank you again to the EIP and, and all the partners uh, uh, for, to, for organizing this event and really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle and Obehi. Uh, yes, please do. I was I was going to suggest we drop a link to ACE uh, in the chat for everyone's easy access. Um, but wonderful way to to kick off this conversation about uh, various data sets available across all of these organizations that are represented here. Uh, so moving right along, let's let's jump into the next discussion. Um, the title here is Encouraging a Learning Agenda for EMBs. Uh, we'll have as our presenter, Hannah Roberts, who is an IFAS consultant serving as the lead on this particular project, uh, and who is also an election practitioner specializing in observation and assistance. Uh, this was a co-authored initiative with uh, Dr. Stefan Darnoff, uh, who is the Senior Global Advisor of Elections Operations and Administration at IFAS, as well as Catherine Murphy, a Research Coordinator at IFAS in the Center for Applied Research and Learning. So over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Cassie. So I've got a presentation, so I'll have a go at the screen sharing. Hopefully you're seeing that. So as Cassie said, we wanted to spend this time to look at an unusual piece of work we've just conducted with IFAS with many partners, where we've been looking at the issue of EMB lessons learned exercises. 
And the way that we approached it is what we'll focus on during this session. And in terms of the content of what we think is good practice for lessons learned exercises by EMBs, we were planning to discuss that more on the Wednesday session at 2 p.m. on EMBs. So as I say, this session's more looking at the research approach that we took to the work. First to say the challenge that we saw is that lessons learned processes are not always consistently undertaken or well undertaken by EMBs. So while we see some very good practice around the world, we also see that there are some election administrations who don't conduct a lessons learned process or do it in a rather minimal way, maybe not involving stakeholders, maybe not going deep into the issues, maybe not doing public reporting on what they think has gone well in an election and what can be improved for next time and what steps could be taken to make those improvements. We see this as a crucial step in an election cycle, that only by reflecting on an election and engaging stakeholders in that can EMBs really look to make practical steps forward that can be effective in improving election processes. We see it as a key part of EMBs taking responsibility for making changes, for making improvements, and for working with others in the roles that they may have in this. So while we see this as a crucial step and with mixed levels of, of practice, we also saw that there was a gap in terms of support for EMBs on this. And while a number of organizations and individuals have worked with EMBs on how they do lessons learned exercises, there was no, or there are no guidelines on this. There's no consistently recognized good practice on this. It's been a much more uh, individual approach, which has the advantage, of course, that it's very context specific and tailored to an individual's country's needs, but also is a loss in the sense that there isn't a recognition of what is good practice and how best to do lessons learned exercises and to use this important step in going forward. We were very conscious that given the experience that we and others have, we would be able to produce some guidelines relatively easily, but the actual use of them would be the harder issue in that we could produce pieces of paper and beautiful graphics or whatever, but that wouldn't necessarily mean that they would get used or that change would happen. So we were really focused on how could we try and approach this in a different way to generate interest in having guidelines on lessons learned with a sense of trying to develop a sense of good practice around what is the what is a, uh, an effective way to do lessons learned exercises. We were also very lucky that we had generous funding from CEDA, which meant that we could really focus on how on the, appro the process that we were doing, not just the end result. So rather than, as I say, just drafting guidelines, we really put a lot of work into having a very, very extensive process before even starting the drafting. And the idea of this was really to involve as many players as possible, in particular EMBs, so that there would be a sense that these guidelines would come from election administrations rather than just appearing on their desk. Also other election actors and people who have a stake in elections and an interest in how an election administration may develop its practice. We also wanted to have a very strong evidence basis so it would be harder for people to dismiss the guidelines that we were wanted to come up with, that there would be a more convincing basis for what we were saying. So with that, we again really wanted to hear from EMBs about what their current practices are and the way that they see that lessons learned exercises could be developed. We also thought that by doing this, it would improve the quality as we would have the, the benefit of many people's input rather than our own. So the first step that we did was talk to some colleagues from election administrations, but also to colleagues from other agencies, in particular, UN Election Assistance Division and UNDP. And it, it kind of felt like each person talked to, there would be another idea of how we could do something else to help strengthen this process. So we started with a quite modest idea of, oh, maybe we'll do a little survey. And it kind of grew and grew and grew and became quite an enormous process that ended up taking, uh, it has taken over a year of part-time work by us all. But it's, as I say, has kind of grown uh, organically. Um, sometimes it felt a little more than we were envisioning. And we perhaps wondered if we'd bitten off more than we could chew. 
The other element of doing this was that we really wanted to build consensus around organizations that work with election administration. So rather than just have an IFAS product at the end, this would be something that the broader election community could feel comfortable with and have a sense of ownership with. Again, so it could be more persuasive to people that this is that lessons learned exercise are a thing worth doing and that there is a recognition of how to do them well, what the essential elements are and how to do them well. That obviously can be adapted and changed according to circumstance, but at least there's a recognition of the principles and the basic steps involved. And with that in mind, we also wanted to have a practical tool at the end of it. So not just principles, but also a sort of how to step by step guide that EMBs could follow if they wanted to. But it would be documented the sort of different steps involved and different considerations, different mitigating measures that could be taken. So that was the evolving approach that we had. And at the heart of it uh, was a survey we did of election administrations, and I'll talk more about that later. But in the end, we ended up with 57 EMBs and from 57 countries completing the survey. In addition, we had another separate survey of election experts who work with election administrations on things like lessons learned exercises in order to get the benefit of their experience. And many of them had worked with more than one election or you know, several and in different parts of the world election administrations. So we really wanted to harness what they knew. In addition, we spoke with organizations that work with political parties, so with eight altogether internationally. And we had two focus group discussions with citizen observer groups, so with nine leading citizen observer groups uh, that have all uh, that, that, were, that were facilitated by NDI. And finally, we met with some development partners, a limited number with four, so with, the, the, with agencies that have someone at their headquarters who has an overview of their election work. So that was the broad uh, research. And then to go into a bit more detail about the EMB surveys, I think that's probably the, uh, the one that was most original from a practitioner point of view and also probably of most interest to the audience here. It was uh, developed by ourselves, practitioners, as I say, in conjunction with some election administration practitioners, and also in discussion with colleagues in other organizations, in particular, as I mentioned, the two UN agencies. So it involves several uh, graphs and reiterations and adaptation to make the questions appropriate for the survey format. We then translated it into five languages. So we had it in Arabic, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian. And then of course, the big challenge was the distribution, getting it into the hands of EMBs. And for this, we had extremely strong collegial collaboration from many partner organizations that really assisted either through their own networks or through their experts in different countries who would then uh, or be in touch with people within the, the local election administration in order to encourage the completion of the survey. So as you can see on the slide, there's, there were a number of election administration networks, but also other intergovernmental agencies that supported us as well as election assistance organizations. As a result of this growing uh, research. It was quite staggered in terms of the survey and there were various extensions. So it took quite a bit longer than we were originally envisaging. And there was a lot of nudging from our colleagues and partners, which we're very grateful for. So in total with the survey, we contacted 152 countries, EMBs. We got 84 individual responses, but some of some EMBs, we ended up with two or even more responses from one EMB. This was accidental, but rather than by intention, of course. So then we had the dilemma of how to use that data. And we thought it was a stronger data for us to refer to EMBs rather than just completed surveys. So the approach that we took was that we would take the answer from the most senior representative who had answered the survey. So that in the end, we ended up with a data set of 57 EMBs that we were using. So overall, that gave us a response rate of 38% of the countries that we'd contacted that we had survey data from. And by geographical area, uh, most were from Europe, 21. Uh, we had 13 from Africa, 13 from the Americas, eight from Asia Pacific, and two from the Middle East and North Africa. So it was quite a range, but obviously not perfect. 
Then in terms of the data management, uh, we had overall 30 questions. Some of them had sub questions. So it ended up with quite a big data set. Some were very uh, simple, sort of yes, no. Some were graded questions. Most of them were factual questions, but some were assessment or asking people's opinion on, for example, how they thought a lessons learned exercise could be useful and there would be a drop down menu. And we always gave people the choice of don't know or not applicable. We then translated all answers into English and worked with, as I say, these, uh, these different types of questions. And with the graded questions, we gave a scoring. So for example, uh, somewhat useful would score a four, but uh, not so useful would score a three, et cetera. So we could get a sense of the answers over, or, or a quantified way of using the answers overall. All of the answers were anonymized. This was very clearly explained as we were encouraging frank answers to questions. And I think all that we got through the survey, as well as our other elements of research, were, there was a lot of consistency in this topic. It's not such a controversial topic in principle. Of course, in practice, it may not always work out that way, but I think that made it easier for us in a way to work with the data with the answers we were getting. Some of the challenges that we faced, as I mentioned, was reaching the EMBs and just who was the right person? Did we, did we or our partners have an organisation there and have a contact person there? As, and as I say, because we had multiple partners, sometimes there was an overlap that, for example, an IFAS person working in country might contact somebody and a UNDP might contact someone else. And of course, we were encouraging harmonisation in this, but sometimes uh, the way it worked was that it, it, there was some duplication. So as I say, that was a challenge of duplication between us, but also within the EMB. And it was certainly time consuming, I would say, for the people doing the nudging um, as, and of course, uses some of their capital with the EMB or the EMB colleagues if they're you know, asking them to fill in this survey. Some of the other challenges was just the length of time it took to develop, to distribute, giving the extensions, the translations, et cetera. As I say, it was much more than we were originally thinking of. And of course that had cost implications. The other thing that we just really wanted to flag is that we were aware that there's a survey selection bias in the countries that will choose to answer this survey or be encouraged to do so through the partners. And also potentially, even though it was anonymized and affirmation bias that people would want to project their EMB in a more positive light than perhaps was always reality. So we tried to mitigate this by, as I say, working with a range of organizations. So we had different entry points with a range of different sorts of EMBs. And as I say, anonymizing the answers, but also uh, we were conscious this wouldn't be totally sufficient. And so it was important for us to be having other research sources too. As I mentioned, the disc, uh, thank you, Cassie, two minutes. <laughs> uh, so some of the other challenges we had is again, with the speaking to the experts, that again, that was a burden for them. The citizen observers facilitating, meeting the leading ones and the logistical challenges of that with time differences. With political parties, they, of course, we couldn't meet with parties directly because there would just be too many in too many different countries. So we had to work through organizations that work with parties. But some of them didn't really know about election administration as such, so didn't always have such an informed opinion. And with development partners, our challenge was that very few of them have somebody at headquarters who has that overview of elections. Just to say briefly, so far where we're at is that we've got a second draft that has just gone out to partners. We've had that through having this very strong evidence-based process, we've got a lot of partners who are really on board for this. So at the moment, in addition to IFAS leading, We've got 12 organizations adding their, adding their logos. So that's EMB networks, other development partners, technical assistance providers, observer networks, including GenDem. So we think this gives a very sort of strong message about the importance of lessons learned, that there's such consistency in a very broad community of organizations, and most importantly with EMB networks at the heart of it, and also a consistency about what is good practice for lessons learned exercises. And we hope that this is living and that we'll come back to this in some way in the future and review that it's not just like guidelines that are done. So just my final words to my last two slides are that for us, it seems to have been a very positive process in getting a better quality of materials for EMBs that we've had so much input. That sense that it comes from EMBs hopefully means it will land better. It enables more coherence amongst election organization. It gives 
citizen observers and parties a stronger tool for advocate for a proper lessons learned process and hopefully also makes it easier for getting funding from national sources and from international sources for lessons learned exercises. And finally, what I wanted to say was just to also for us that we were conscious that it was very resource intensive and it took a lot of goodwill from partners. Uh, perhaps we could have involved academics at the start who would have more experience than we did. As I say, it sort of gained, it grew organically, but I think with hindsight, we should have reached out. And the survey was demanding for EMB, so we're conscious it's not something that just be, can, can be repeated, even if it has the advantages we've talked about. And finally, just wanted to emphasize that for us, it was also very clear it has, the use of the survey had to be balanced with also involving other voices in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time warning, Cassie. I'm happy to answer any questions later. Yeah, thank you, Hannah, for a really interesting deep dive into the methodology and the process behind this effort. I'm sure it's much appreciated and, and will uh, inspire a lot of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I think you've also called attention to some shared challenges that we'll hear more about in our next presentation. So we'll we'll move over to our, our third and final presentation before we open for a conversation. Uh, and this presentation will be co-led by Sonali Campion, who is a PhD researcher at the University of East Anglia studying election management body capacity. She is currently also a visiting scholar at International IDEA. And her co-presenter, Abdul Rashid Solizhanov, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, I tried really hard, uh, currently is working as a consultant for the electoral processes team of International IDEA. He's responsible for maintaining, updating, and developing IDEA's election-related databases, uh, and also responds to user and media inquiries related to elections, developing targeted infographics and other content uh, for social media using data uh, from these databases. So really nice to, to tie together some of the threads of what we're discussing here. Uh, with Without any uh, more comments from me, I want, we want to hear what you have to say. Uh, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, I'll be starting this presentation and then Sonali will be uh, following up. So uh, I will have a presentation that I need to share. So uh, this presentation is actually uh, only about uh, election-related databases of international idea. So uh, international idea at the moment maintains several other data sets also. For example, a GOCD data set, which is about global state of democracy. This database, it's in itself a huge database and then it requires separate presentation itself. So, and then there are some few other data sets developed by colleagues uh, like uh, information environment and about uh, information about related to elections data set developed by my colleague. But uh, in this presentation, I'll be focusing only on election related database uh, directly maintained by myself and then some uh, colleagues in the elections. So, uh, we maintain. Uh, these 11 data sets at the moment uh, in our website. So the, the, the top eight databases, are we call them traditional databases. Uh, these uh, data from these databases actually stem from the handbooks developed by International IDEA since 2000, 2000s. Uh, some of them quite known in, in the, in the, by the AMBs like electro system design database. Uh, handbook, for example, uh, is still one of the most frequently downloaded handbooks of international idea. So uh, data uh, collected for these handbooks later were transferred to online platforms so that when people uh, read the handbooks of uh, related to these topics, they can see the up-to-date data for those handbooks in the, in the online platform. So having said that, I need to mention that our databases are mostly tailored and focused uh, to, 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 to practitioners and the media. And then therefore we provided the online platforms to, to, to allow users to explore data in an easy format and then uh, uh, create graphs and then to, to uh, develop summaries of the data in the online platform. 
So this is uh, these data sets in uh, practitioners already. But having said that, I, I need to mention that also, for example, what we're talking about database actually uh, widely used by academia and then researchers uh, but use several peer-reviewed articles using the Rotatona data. So uh, even though we focus the practitioners, our data are used also by uh, academia also. So uh, the traditional databases are these eight databases. <clears throat> and then we recently worked on the new topics. Uh, in parallel to COVID pandemic, we developed a special voting arrangements data set. Uh, it's available online. And then in parallel of this development of the data set, some uh, handbooks are also being a handbook on this topic is being drafted now, it's published soon. And then also we developed out of country voting on our data set separately. Uh, and then in parallel to this work, we also developed tech for uh, use of technology in the OCV data set. So as I said, these are the, the topics we identified that uh, uh, our practitioners and then people, I mean, civil society and other people working with elections and generally all, all the stakeholders working with elections have demand for that data and then identifying that demand we developed the recent new data sets. So, um, so how we data are presented in the online platform? So uh, again, uh, having the practitioners and, and then the, this outlook, we, we come up with the following uh, layout. So we provide the data, actual data. It can be just the numbers or uh, like your standard options. For example, I can give you one example here. Uh, E-voting, about e-voting, you will provide the answer yes in political binding national elections, this type of data. And then each uh, data value is, uh, is supported by comments. So we expand uh, data in the comment section by providing more in-depth information about the data point. This is again useful for practitioners who are interested in more in-depth information in the, in the practices we cover in the databases. And also third category, we provide sources so uh, uh, I will mention about the sources in the later uh, slides, but here we mainly use, mostly use electoral law, and then we provide the, we provide a hyperlink to the law and then date of access and then which version of the electoral law we used for coding the data. And yeah, as I said, and uh, so we, in addition to practitioners and media are quite excessively uses the databases. I, I, I can give you one number. So in 2022, last year, about 246 media articles have used data to for their media articles using our data. So how we update uh, the data the databases? So as I said, we, uh, we use mainly the the electoral law to code the data. In this um, applies to most of the data in our databases, but not all of them. <laughs> Exceptions are what the tone up database, we get the numbers just from the EMB website or other relevant sources. And then for take for OCV data, we uh, actually collected de facto data. I mean, uh, collecting information about how the technology are used in the out of country voting. And then also this partially applies to ICT database. So we uh, identify which types of ICTs are used uh, in real life during the elections and we call data based on de facto data. And then also for voting from a broad database, we partially cover uh, de facto data. So it's a mixture of de jure and de facto data in our, our databases. And then uh, we also obtain data directly from the EMB website. We use like uh, publications, reports, or just information posted in the EMB website to code the data, and it's especially what it turned out in ICT databases. And then when we, do, when we cannot find data from the two uh, uh, sources, we go to additional secondary sources like electoral emission observation, electoral observation mission reports, and news reports from the reliable sources, and then other reliable sources we identify. So we have a, quite a list of, uh, of secondary sources, these databases. And then we sometimes we hire regional researchers and experts, especially for the new data sets we developed recently. We hired several uh, regional researchers and experts. And then we also conduct EMB surveys, but uh, as Hannah mentioned, we have the response rate in our case is also very low. And 
So uh, challenges we have, I mean, we do mostly desk research. So lack of sources, hard to find the latest version of the electoral law, and then stand, these are the standard challenges I think most of our colleagues encounter during data collection. And then some of EMB websites, I mean, dysfunctional. And then, as I said, when we conduct in the surveys, the response rate is very low and the language barrier in, in other challenge. So we, uh, there are many, quite a number of countries uh, not providing electoral law in English, English language. So we have to able, we hire local respondents and experts. And then reliability of the data, even so it's provided by regional experts, we have to check and go back and check check several times in order to really to make sure that the data, the, the codings are reliable. And then reliability of official sources, we, we see quite often that in B data are not reliable, inflated order to inflate features, for example. And the coding challenges we have quite in electro system design database, we have uh, uh, certain data categories which require expert knowledge to call the data and then we have to go to specific uh, uh, kind of researchers and the experts in the field to obtain help in coding the data. That's a quite, uh, I mean, these are the frequent challenges we have. So uh, looking ahead, so we, we want to be uh, I mean, to stay relevant, so we, we continue updates. At the moment, we can update the databases based on the election calendar. So uh, when user enters our database, they see the data at least based on latest elections. So that's, uh, we, want, we always try to be kind of consistent and updating, but there are challenges. We, there are gaps in the data. So that there are several tiny issues that we need to solve and they, at the moment, Water turnout data, for example, uh, there are many countries having two more than one elections per year, and then we need to add data for those countries, and then we are going to do this quite soon. And then, as I said, there are gaps in the data, so in the, in the future we need to uh, close the gaps in the data and I mean trying to explore other, I mean the, the other possibilities that we will be discussing in this session, like partnerships. And then updates in between elections, for example, data are quite are changed frequently in between elections. And then we cannot, if we can't um, uh, capture them and then the, our data is relevant. So we need to focus on the, in, the uh, changes in between elections also. And then again, as we uh, focus on practitioners, we need the better functionalities in the online databases. And then we have budget restrictions. We thought that things to explore in the future is to find a budget to, to be really uh, to, to develop really uh, a good functionalities in our database. So the growth opportunities, uh, I mean, my colleagues only will be this, uh, talking about those. So I will now pass on this to Son Sonali. Brilliant, thanks Rashid. Um, so yeah, as, as Hannah and I think many of the other previous speakers demonstrated, there's lots of valuable um, information to be gained by speaking to EMBs um, and that's for academics, that's for policy makers, uh, that's for practitioners. Um, but as uh, interest, especially academic interest in this field grow, there is a danger that EMBs uh, receive excessive requests for um, a lot of very similar information. Um, we've seen in the past there's also sometimes problems that they get used as entry points to ask questions which don't really fall within their remit um, or get asked for information which is publicly available um, either on their own websites or through channels uh, such as um, existing databases like ideas. Um, so the electoral integrity project is um, having a go at solving some of these challenges um, through the creation um, of a regular survey, the Electoral, uh, electoral Management Survey, um, or EMS. Working collaboratively brings benefits both in terms of ensuring questions are policy relevant uh, and focused on gaps, uh, which I think Hannah spoke to earlier. Um, and it also uh, works in terms of pooling uh, strategies and contacts in order to ensure higher response rates. Um, this isn't the first EMS that we're working on right now. There were uh, surveys run in uh, 2016, so 17 uh, and 2021. Uh, the 2017 one in particular uh, had a lot of collaboration. Uh, it was worked with the Venice Commission and with AWeb. Um, 
But the aim now is to really agree a sort of standard format, which enables the collection of consistent data over time. Um, and we'll have that basis. And then we'll also have a section of rotating questions, which can respond um, to emerging, emerging questions and challenges. So uh, for example, the 2021 survey ended up being very heavily focused on COVID for obvious reasons. Um, so this format has been used effectively elsewhere. Uh, the obvious uh, example is the Perceptions of Electoral Integrity uh, Survey, which we saw the latest results of at the beginning. Um, so the aim here is not to eliminate other EMB surveys. We recognize um, that lots of people will require very specialized uh, information gathering for their activities, but it is to reduce requests for the same information. Um, I've done a review of surveys over the last, uh, particularly the last five years, uh, and it highlights not only has there been an increase in the number of surveys um, in recent years, but there is also a significant overlap in the topics that are getting asked, particularly around structure and design. Um, and during COVID-19, there were several on that. Um, a regular survey from a known entity also provides a level of predictability to EMBs. Uh, if they know to expect a survey every two years, this can facilitate responsiveness, which we know from previous surveys and, and other experience that is difficult. And we can also regularize appropriate contacts. Um, identifying electoral officials with the ex both the expertise and the authority to respond uh, is often a major barrier um, in this area, uh, both to the number, of quality, number and quality of responses. Um, so this survey effort uh, also underscores the importance of engaging EMB in, ter in terms of responding to their data needs. Um, the ACE findings as that we saw at the beginning are very valuable uh, to us understanding what practitioners require. Um, and we're also in this survey seeking to get input from EMBs of the kind of data that they're interested in seeing. Um, because I think often they get asked questions and they're not really sure what the value of it is to them. So if we can find ways of, of responding to what they're looking for, then that's also more likely to encourage responsiveness. Um, research communication is also important in this area. Um, so to highlight how information that is being provided is then being used um, and encourage the uptake of research and policy insights from what, what they provide um, and showing that to them is, is a really great way to encourage uh, participation and engagement. Um, so the data from the previous election management surveys uh, is available via uh, the Electoral Integrity Project website. And this will be the same going forward. Um, it's obviously important that when we take collaborative approaches, uh, that the data is public and accessible to researchers, practitioners and democracy organisations. And we mean fully public, so not just to the partners um, that are involved. And I think this speaks to the value of open data in our field. Um, I think it's always worth considering when you are gathering uh, data, whether it can as a whole be made public um, or uh, elements of it can be made public. Um, in some scenarios, we do recognize that there will be sensitivities or confidentiality confidentiality considerations or that you wouldn't get as much information if it's all going to be available um, and also that we recognize that uh, preparing data for publication is also a big job um, however just by having these conversations uh, at the outset it's possible to establish if something can be made available um, and also uh, that appropriate consent is uh, secure from participation to participants during data collection um, as we've discussed, uh, the ACE network resources are a go-to for practitioners and academics alike. And databases, uh, such as the ones that have been introduced here, as well as ones uh, developed by VDEM and IFIS and others, um, are really invaluable in this area. So I think it speaks to the fact that coordinating efforts um, across organisations really does enable um, more efficient use of time and resources and can help to better serve both the practitioner and research community. Um, as IFIS has really highlighted, this isn't uh, always easy. Um, and this whole data gathering is really, it, it can be really difficult, but um, by avoiding duplication and making it easier for our partners to, um, to engage uh, does really help. 
So on that note, um, I just say, please reach out if you have any questions or suggestions uh, relating to the election management survey. Um, we'll post a, a link in the uh, chat, which has contact details, but also the uh, data from our previous survey. So you can see the kind of questions that have been asked in the past. Thank you. Thank you.